My wife, Marcia, and I were living in Winona and I uh, was teaching at St. Mary's and was always enamored of this library, like I think most people in town have been. Chad Ubel, who at that time was the library director, found in the old director's office a collection of documents that no one had looked at for many, many, many years. Chad Ubel and myself and Julie Johnson got together and we started thinking that, boy, this really is material that should be used to write the history of this remarkable building. There's a kind of a safe sort of thing. This is where all this stuff was. And I went through all that stuff for many, many hours. Kind of felt like I was one of the librarians there for a while. I was on for six months or something, I was in there. The whole process probably went on over about a year, which by the way, was not only here in Winona with the material the library had, but also the material that the Historical Society here in Winona had. And then there was also material up in the Minnesota Historical Society archives up in St. Paul. The idea was not just to capture the history of the building, but also to raise the profile of the significance of the building in the community with the idea that people would take more responsibility. Because what the story of this library really shows is that a library is strong and grows and creates a beautiful building when it has a lot of community engagement. The idea was to kind of carry on that tradition by reminding people of how the library came to be. Obviously the first thing about Winona and why it was here is because of the river. Transportation is always what drives these things. Winona started becoming a place where wheat was brought in, milled, and shipped out again, especially in the 1850s when things got started. But then something else happened in Winona that really made it take off, and that was the lumber industry. Winona was well located downstream from where the Chippewa River enters the Mississippi, even farther downstream from where the St. Croix River enters the Mississippi. So up there in that triangle, there was huge pine forests that the lumbermen were buying up and taking down the lumber and shipping it down the river, and eventually it would come to places like Winona. All along the riverfront, eventually there was four massive lumber companies with their mills. Besides European Americans coming and taking over the Dakota land here, they didn't stop at Winona, but they kept going west, all the way across Minnesota into the Dakotas. Starting about 1862, there was a railroad line from Winona going west. That provided a way for the lumber companies to ship their lumber that had been milled here in Winona, where people were building farms and towns and homes and basically building everything, mostly of wood. There was a gigantic demand for that lumber. Winona just happened to be the perfect place. And eventually there was five railroads in Winona. The people who were driving that, who were primarily what you could call Yankees, that is to say, people of Scott or English ancestry who were from the East Coast, born in places like New York and Pennsylvania. They were the ones who came in with a little bit of capital and were really driving that development. Before long, there was other people coming into Winona. They came because by this time we have these industries growing up. Winona became really kind of unique in the sense that for a smaller town, they have a significant Polish population. These Poles were all mostly from the same place, from Kashubia in the northern part of Poland. They formed a pretty strong, vital community on the East End, built their own magnificent church, St. Stanislaus. They came primarily to work in the lumber mills or for the railroads or for other kind of industries. And the same was true of Scandinavians, Norwegians, Swedes, Irish. You also have among this kind of growing middle class professionals, these wealthy men, lawyers, judges, etc., didn't just make donations to the city in various ways, but they were also very active in the library board, the park board, and other boards where they actually were involved in the day-to-day -day management of these institutions. By the end of the 19th century, Winona for a while was the third biggest city in Minnesota and really thought it was going places. It really was kind of a dynamic boom town. Eventually the economy became more diverse when you get things like Watkins Products and the Winona Normal School being organized very early 
eventually other colleges. So it became a pretty dynamic town. In the early 1850s, when Winona was first getting started, there was these two families that were related where their sons came to Winona. They had a little bit of capital because they came from prosperous farms in Pennsylvania, and they could see that this lumber thing was going someplace. So they started a little retail lumber business. But there was a big depression in 1857, and that kind of took the wind out of their sails. Three of them stuck with it, and that was William Harris Laird, James Norton, and Matthew Norton. After the depression was over, sure enough, things started coming back. If you were gonna make money doing lumber, the first thing you needed was access to that timber up north. Secondly, they needed to have a strong, efficient, effective mill. And thirdly, you needed to have a marketing strategy. And if you can control those three things, then you could make a lot of money, and that's exactly what they did. By the 1880s, 1890s, those three men were recognized by some publications back east as three of Winona's millionaires. And by 1905 was about the time around there when all the lumber mills shut down. Those pine forests up the river in the St. Croix and the Chippewa Valley were pretty much done. The Laird Norton Company, which is what they call themselves, they connect with Frederick Weyerhaeuser and bought land first in Idaho and then in the Pacific Northwest. And so then they made even more money. But even though they had done that and their investment was moving to the West, they mostly stayed here in Winona. The Laird Norton Company didn't officially move to Seattle until 1958. Even then, the marketing part of what Laird Norton had set up and what the other lumber companies set up continued. Along those railroad lines out to the West, they had what they called line yards. And those lumber yards or line yards eventually evolved into full-scale building supply companies. These Yankees, these people of English and Scottish heritage who were kind of the entrepreneurs, the professionals, the middle class in Winona, what they had in mind was building a real city. I mean, they had this kind of urban expectations and their idea of what a city would look like would be something like on the East Coast or in Europe, etc. They imagined cities that had kind of grand public spaces and parks, grand courthouses, and certainly libraries. But the libraries that existed before that time were not public libraries. Well, the common word for them is subscription libraries. That is to say, you would pay a fee, you would subscribe to the library, and that would give you the right to borrow materials or to visit the reading room. I mean, anybody could join them, but only if they could pay the fee. And so they tended to be very much limited to the middle class. This is what happened in Winona. A group of young men, apparently they call themselves the Young Men Library Association, formed one of these subscription libraries. They found out very quickly that to make it work, they had to do pretty much constant fundraising, which was not a bad thing because their fundraisers were fun. They had like strawberry festivals. The most popular kind of fundraising for these kind of library associations in the early days was lectures by famous people. So in 1867, for example, the Young Men's Library Association got into one of these lecture circuits to make money. In their speaking series that year was people like Wendell Phillips, the famous abolitionist, and Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, of course, was a former enslaved person who had escaped, and then he became a big part of the abolition movement. First off, he was an incredibly imposing man. He was tall, broad-shouldered, had this incredible mane of hair. And he had mastered the art of speaking in such a way that was both educational and entertaining at the same time. Unfortunately, however, when Frederick Douglass came in 1867, he booked himself a room in the Huff Hotel and was denied a room. It was a great embarrassment to the people who had invited him. They brought him to one of their homes, one of the big homes around here. A dinner was had for him where the mayor and all these people came and had dinner with him to sort of make up for the fact that he was not allowed a room in the Huff House Hotel. They involved women of their acquaintance in this fundraising activity. 
And pretty soon, women just became a big part of the Young Men's Library Association, so much so that they had to change the name to the Winona Library Association. At one point, the thing kind of broke down and they ran out of money. Three women from the group, including Charlotte Prentice, who was a young woman at the time, stepped in and kind of saved the Library Association. Meanwhile, nationwide, there's a public movement to try to move past this idea of subscription libraries into public libraries. One of the things that had to happen to make that possible was that the legislature of every state had to pass a law that would authorize counties or cities to tax their population to support a library. Finally, in 1879, the Minnesota legislature passed such a law. Then the people of the Monona Library Association started campaigning for that, and it took a while. But finally, in 1886, they got the Winona City Council to approve a free public library. At the time, the Winona Library Association had this rickety old building at 4th and Lafayette, which was a former schoolhouse that had no longer been used by the schools, called the Monroe School. It was a two-story building, and they were on the upper floor. It was really hot in the summer and really cold in the winter. And as they got more and more books, they worried that if they put any more books on the second floor, the building was going to fall down. By this time, a guy named Frederick Bell, who was the son-in-law of William Harris Laird, was the chair of the library board. The library board was made up of these very wealthy entrepreneurs and professionals. What they managed to do is they got the city to deed to them this rickety schoolhouse. Meanwhile, Fred Bell was talking to his father-in-law, William Harris Laird. They start talking about the possibility of solving this problem by an act of philanthropy. About the same time, Andrew Carnegie, maybe the richest man in the world, was already in the business of library philanthropy. Carnegie began by donating libraries to the towns in Pennsylvania where his steel mills had been, and then had just started thinking about maybe giving towns all across the United States a library would be a good idea. He wrote two articles. The two articles are referred to as the Gospel of Wealth articles. And the first article said that a wealthy man had the responsibility, the duty, to give away his excess money to the common good. And in the second article, he spelled out what he thought that would be. He listed a number of things like universities, hospitals, and also libraries. Certainly, William Harris Laird was influenced by that. And so what happened in Winona was, even before Carnegie began his massive gifts of giving libraries all around the country, William Harris Laird decided to do the same thing in Winona. William Harris Laird had chosen his nephew, Warren Powers Laird, to design the library. The young architect, he was only about 30 years old, but he was a rising star on the East Coast because he was already the dean of the new architecture school at the University of Pennsylvania. Laird came back and informed the library board and the city council that he wanted to make this gift and the gift would be of this beautiful building and that it would cost about $40,000, which does not sound like much, but it was a lot of money way over a million dollars, depending on how you do that calculation. William Harris Laird was pushed by his nephew and by Fred Bell to make the building maybe a little grander than the $40,000 was going to allow for. This building looks a lot like what many people would say is a Carnegie Library, but it's actually more opulent than any of the Carnegie Libraries are. Two respects in particular. One, it's got this beautiful Bedford limestone finish most Carnegie libraries are brick with a little bit of limestone or stone accent. The second thing was the incredible dome on top of the exchange room in the center of the building. In the Carnegie library program, $40,000 would be kind of what Carnegie might have given Winona if Winona had asked for a Carnegie library. Probably the building cost more like about $50,000 when it was done. It was basically two levels, basically a one floor building with a basement. But to make that one-story building seem very grand, the one story is up above grade, maybe about eight feet or so. And then the basement is below grade, about eight feet. And then on top of that, you have this magnificent dome. So it looks like a much bigger building than it really is. The interiors were another matter. This is where their woodworking came in. This library has 
kind of the best of both worlds, the beautiful exterior, but also this incredibly detailed oak woodwork in these rooms that have incredibly high ceilings and beautiful wood cornices all around. That was supplied by Laird Norton. So why this location? William Harris Laird owned this property. <laughs> that was the first thing. Laird said to the city, if you would buy the Monroe School Building for $5,000, then the library board will have that $5,000. They will give the $5,000 to me and I will sell them the property in which the new library would sit on. The other reason was because it was surrounded by all kinds of other buildings that were important to him and his family. Matthew Norton, James Norton, William Harris Laird, Fred Bell, they all live within two or three blocks of this building. The Masonic Temple, of course, was just down the street. They were Masons. Across Broadway was the first congregational church, and that was the church of the Laird family. And on this side of the street, down a block, was the Central Methodist Church, which was the church of the Norton family. Plus, it was pointed out that it was a good location for everybody, close to a streetcar line, close to the normal school. It was a good location in general. When it was done in 1899, William Harris Laird came to the library board and the city council and says, I have now done what I promised, which was to build this building, and reminded them of what they had promised in return, which was that they would fund the library at a certain mill rate, taxable rate, in perpetuity to make sure the building was always well financed. People were really pretty thrilled by it because it had solved a problem that seemed insoluble in a way that kind of was beyond what anybody thought was gonna happen by having a library like this. When William Harris Laird decided to make this gift to the library, library design was changing, but it hadn't quite changed yet. So as you entered the front door of the library, you came into that beautiful exchange room underneath the dome, and there was the circulation desk. And the books were all behind the circulation desk in the stacks, and you asked for a book, and the librarian went and got it for you. They built the stack room, which was of three levels, Melvin Dewey, the man who created the Dewey Decimal System, had created a company on the East Coast to supply infrastructure for libraries. The glass floors were, of course, to allow light to pass through, so you had more light on the books. By the turn of the century, in the library world, people were starting to say, hmm, why do we have closed stacks anyway? In the Carnegie libraries, there is no separate stack room. Usually what happens is there's bookshelves all around the exterior of the library. Librarians thought, well, that was really kind of a more democratic way to do it, and also that browsing was really an important part of being in the library. When this library was designed in the 1890s, that kind of reform in the library world hadn't quite sunk in yet. This was a period of big growth in terms of the number of people in Winona that were participating, which of course was exactly the point of creating a public library. Sure enough, within 15 years after the library opened, the stacks needed to be expanded, and the Laird Norton family came through again and funded an expansion of the stacks. It looks pretty much like the original stacks. It just continues out farther. Now, of course, for a long time, the stacks have been open, and that's been a really treat for anyone who lives in Winona to prowl around in the stacks and walk around on those glass floors. After the turn of the century in most of the Carnegie libraries that were built in Minnesota, having a children's department was pretty much built into library design, but that wasn't the case with this library. It had, though, a good-sized lecture hall that could seat 250 people and that could be used for library programming or that could be used for any sort of community event. In Minnesota, there was two very important women who were the leaders of the public library movement. One was Gracia Countryman, who was eventually the director of the Minneapolis Public Library, and another woman called Clara Baldwin, who became the director of the library program within the state government, was eventually part of the Department of Education. They both campaign for a number of things. One was to extend library services throughout the state so it reached everyone, not just in the towns and cities. And also they very much were interested in encouraging libraries to have separate children's departments. Clara Baldwin came and she encouraged this library to think about a children's department. The library got a grant from someone and used that money to turn the lecture hall into the children's department in about 1920. But Gracia Countryman said, if you reach out to children and make children friends of the library, they will be friends of the library for their whole lives. 
women really became the people who actually made the libraries work. But the unfortunate thing was, is that once being a librarian became primarily a job for women, it meant that it was gonna be really lowly paid. Librarians tended to be very highly educated, very knowledgeable, and very poorly paid all at the same time. Charlotte Prentice was like a huge part of the history of the library from the beginning. From the Winona Library Association, on the board of the Winona Public Library after the board was created. And then she resigned from the board to become an actual librarian. Later in life, when I think she was 49, she married William Hayes, who was another one of the Laird Norton clan. She died, I think, five or six years after they got married. It's really a tragic thing. He was so moved by this that he wanted to do something to really have a memorial to her in the library. He hired a very famous mural painter named Kenyon Cox to design a mural that went up into the dome they call the Light of Learning. And it's one of these idealized classical portrayals of enlightenment being passed on through the centuries through the different disciplines, art and philosophy and history, etc. It seems strange now, but it made a lot of sense to people at the time that this building would be not just a place for books, but would also be kind of an art museum for Winona. In the design, they set aside a separate room, actually two rooms. One was the art room, and then in the middle of that art room, there was a spiral staircase down into another room, which was called the cast room, which meant a room for sculpture. The library received many gifts of art, especially in the early years. For example, the statue of Hebe that Della Laird, William Harris Laird's wife, uh, donated to the library after a trip to Florence. The art room was actually a gallery for lots of shows of all kinds of art over the years. One person who actually became very famous, Rockwell Kent, had a little show here. For them, it was all part of the same thing, kind of bringing enlightenment to Winona through books or through art. In 1968, they changed the city charter, and one of the reasons for changing the city charter was to get rid of the independent boards that governed the library in the park district. And then we get into a period of a number of recessions. What happens with libraries is that they tend to take a hit when there's a recession. Their budgets are cut in some significant way. And then when the recession's over, they find it really difficult to regain where they were even right before the recession began. The ironic thing is that the usage of libraries was growing to the point where around by 1990 and up to the present time, the library now serves three times as many people as it did when it first began. Several other things happened nationally that had an impact on libraries everywhere, including Winona. One was the American with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990. All libraries that were built around the time that this library was built, for example, all of the Carnegie libraries all around the state, they were reached by these grand staircases. In other words, none of them were really accessible. This was a problem for this library and a problem for all the Carnegie libraries. That was the style of the time. They wanted the building to look grand. Even before 1990, there was a state law that required accessibility. And in 1980, two disabled people in Winona sued the Winona Public Library demanding accessibility. Something was gonna have to be done, so that was on the agenda. The other thing that happened nationally was that Congress passed the National Historic Preservation Act in 1967. That kind of urban renewal idea that you just knock everything down and then build new stuff was kind of the dominant ideology. So with the National Historic Preservation Act, people started thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe these historic buildings not only can be saved, but can be adapted for current use. So all these things complicate the situation <laughs> for the Winona Public Library. But in 1968, after the city charter was passed, at the very last meeting of the library board, the library board passed a resolution saying that the Winona desperately needed a new library building. So this library, it's about 12,000 square feet of usable space. What the various studies had come up with was a this figure of 30,000 square feet. So the first point was is that they needed 30,000 square feet and there was no way to get it on this site. 
Second thing was parking, of course, had always been a problem and actually continues to be a, a problem. Third point was they said, well, a new building could always be built to be more energy efficient. Also would be more adaptable to all the new technology that was coming on to libraries at that time. And finally, I think from talking to librarians around the state, librarians generally tend to favor new buildings. When the city council was thinking about the possibility of a new library, we went around to different library buildings. And I have to admit that I did covet some of the things that I saw. And one of them was a central library checkout system, an open plan for the library where the library staff could observe what was going on in the various corners of the library. And those were some of the things that I felt needed to be looked at. Some of the things that needed to be looked at were further building maintenance, but there were always going to be issues in this building. I and mean, let's face it, that's just the nature of the way things work. This is what a lot of library thinking was about. What are the things that we should look at in making the decision as to whether or not to go for a new library building? Now, the problem was difficult to solve because the library was on this corner lot and was basically surrounded by the Winona High School and the Winona Middle School and the auditorium that was built right next to it. So there was no direction for any real expansion. So, well, eventually, after all these various commissions and committees met and hired consultants and went through all this thinking, the proposal that finally formed a consensus on the city council was to build a new library on a lot down near the river between Huff and Winona on 2nd Street. It would be a one-story building, which librarians preferred. It would have an adequate parking lot for at least 50 cars. It would be more energy efficient, at least that was the argument. It was a good location. Eventually the city council was won over to this to the extent that they voted seven to nothing to put a major bond referendum, I think it was $3.7 million in 1985. But when the debate started about the referendum, things didn't go so well. In fact, there was kind of a duel between the Winona Daily News and the Winona Post. This referendum for a new library came up for 3.9 million, which of course today is laughable. I mean, you can't even dig a hole for 3.9 million. I thought, well, what's gonna to happen to the old library? There was no plan. I know what happens to buildings when there's no plan for reuse. They fall into disrepair and then everybody wants to tear it down because it's an eyesore. So I wrote an editorial and I came out against the referendum we also had information from a poll saying that the people didn't want it. When the referendum finally came about, the people didn't want it much more strongly than even the poll had indicated. I don't walk very well and I don't do stairs. They put in an elevator. It's not an overcrowded library with a lot of books in it because we have cell call. So all the books don't have to be in one place. We also, of course, have the internet, which we didn't have back then. People read online, they can read on their phones, they can read on their iPads, and you don't need a great big, enormous building for all these books. I think we made the absolute right decision to keep our present library and make it accessible. It's beautiful. So then the city went back to the drawing board and came up with a much smaller idea, which was to add the addition on Johnson Street that exists today, a two-story addition that would include, the main entrance would now be on Johnson Street at street level, handicap accessible, and the circulation desk that would be for both adults and children would be right there by the entranceway too. The beautiful main entrance then became redundant and basically was closed off except for emergencies and for special occasions. The 
the amount of programming and outreach that has grown in my 20-year tenure here, and they certainly were well on their way before I arrived, that has been a major component of our services and offerings is the collaborating and the community partnerships. When COVID hit, we did close per direction of City Council. And we were able to come up with a curbside pickup model. We ordered and received as many new Wi-Fi hotspots as we could get our hands on to satisfy the demand with the increased working from home and the online learning. Our usage has been up since the pandemic. We're seeing pre-pandemic numbers again in circulation as well as foot traffic. Normal for us is still not where we were pre-pandemic as far as the amount of hours we are open per week. We have lost some of our evening hours. We have had a harder time receiving some of our supplies and have seen more expenses. The patrons' needs have become a little greater since the pandemic. I would say that's another change in librarianship is that it's very much more social justice based now than it used to be. We provide services to the most vulnerable of patrons. We are lucky to have a very active Friends of the Library advocacy group, particularly over the lean years of our budget where we really struggled to provide outside programming. The Friends would swoop in and gift us resources. It's a group of caring individuals who get it. They understand what's important to us and they too want to leave a mark and have some lasting contributions to this space. The bulk of our funding is provided through Winona County. The formula has not been updated in maybe 30 years. It is on the platform for Minnesota Library Association legislation this year to get looked at and hopefully that antiquated formula gets updated because it makes a big difference. I think libraries being that they are not revenue generators have struggled more financially and budgetarily than some other city departments across municipalities. I feel having across my 20 or 10 years seen our budget be zeroed out, I feel like we are making a comeback and have proved to be a major necessity in a community hub. I feel better about where we sit financially than we did in some years. I I feel like space, we have constraints, but we've done a pretty creative job of utilizing what we have, and I don't feel like we are short on space. We have a committed staff that's so proud of our bones and really wanting to carry the stories forward. Yeah, I think we have the best corner in town. We are a part of Selco, which is uh, about 35 public libraries in Southeast Minnesota, and the benefit to being a part of that shared ILS, or interlibrary loan system is that we have access to everyone else's catalogs as well. If we can't find it on our shelf, we can get it from a neighboring library or even bigger than that, we can access MinLink, which is the statewide loaning system. The number of library card registered holders that we have, I think is around 10,000. The amount of materials we circ, we have a collection of about 110,000 items. And I believe last year, we searched 300,000 something items. We offer a lot in the way of informational services as well, anything from financial literacy to job searching to helping students of all ages, preschool through college. We see ESL and GED courses being held here five mornings a week. We work with refugee groups here. The genealogy offering ancestry is unique to our building, we have one of the few international ancestry licenses in the area. We see people using laptops and watching movies, listening to books. I would say our computer usage is a widely used resource. Certainly the Youth Services Department is a bundle of energy and they've got a lot of fun things happening. We have a handful of patrons that have been patrons for going on 50 plus years. A couple of those retired gentlemen meet here every morning to read the newspaper together and we call it the Coffee Clutch Gang. They show up without fail, miss us greatly, and know our schedules if one of us is not here to greet them and wish them good day. <laughs> they leave their eyeglasses here and they've got a secret spot on a bookshelf where they hide their glasses overnight. We're home to a lot of people. <laughs>
people most of the time take their library for granted. Whenever you need something, you just go there and it's open and they welcome you and everybody's helpful and it's just a wonderful place and it's always going to be there, right? Well, it hasn't always been there. It was actually built by people who had to really fight and work to make it happen. And the same thing is true to keep it strong in the long run. So in 1980, during that recession, when there started to be big cutbacks in library services, that's when the Friends of the Winona Public Library was organized. A group like that does some of its own fundraising and tries to fill some of the gaps, but also acts as an advocate. When the children's librarian quit to take another job, and the city said we couldn't afford to hire a new children's librarian. The Friends of the Library were really pushing to change that. So they published a fact sheet that said, look, the children's department has become one of the most important parts of the library, if not the most important part of the library. And you have to have a children's librarian, not only to run these story hours and this programming, but to be in charge of acquisition of new children's books and materials. That's important because you remember now, there used to be an independent library board of a strong group of people whose only concern was building and maintaining the library. When the city charter was changed, the library board was ended. Now it's the city council who has that responsibility. But of course they have responsibility for everything. This is why a friends group is so important. You need a group that actually is focused on the library and what the library needs in the present time and in the future. One of the things about William Harris Laird was, and also Carnegie, is that they gave this huge amount of money to cities, and the only string that was attached was requiring that the city promise to support the library from then on out. It would be wonderful, and it's possible, because a lot of money is being made in this town, for some people with money to step up and make a significant donation that would solve this library's long-term issues with expansion.